Okay. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Mujdat Chetan as the speaker for our EC seminar today. Uh, Professor Chetan earned his bachelor's science degree in electrical engineering from Boaz University, Turkey in 1993, and a PhD degree in electrical engineering from Boston University in 2001. He previously worked as a research scientist at MIT and as a faculty member at Saban University in Turkey. He's currently a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Rochester, and he's the director of the Gergen Institute for Data Science and the New York State Center of Excellence in Data Science. He's a fellow of the IEEE and has served as a member of the IEEE Signal Processing Society Technical Directions Board and the chair of the IEEE Computational Imaging and Tech Computational Imaging Technical Committee. He is currently a senior area editor for the IEEE Transactions on Computational Imaging and IEEE Transactions on Image Processing. Uh, his research group has made significant contributions in the areas of computational imaging, in radar and biomedical imaging, in developing probabilistic methods for biomedical image analysis, and signal processing for brain machine interfaces. Mijdat is the recipient of several awards, including the IEEE Signal Processing Society Best Paper Award and the Turkish Academy of Scientists Distinguished Young Scientist Award. Uh, I personally had the pleasure of spending my sabbatical year with Mujdat's research group while he was still at Sabancı University, uh, leading to a very fruitful collaboration. Today, he'll be talking about Bayesian and machine learning methods that his group has been developing for computational imaging. With that, I would like to welcome Mujdat once again. Thank you. Thank you, Tolga, for the very kind uh, introduction. Also, thanks for the invitation. Uh, so in today's talk, uh, I'll touch upon work uh, that's just a few weeks old, but I'll also talk about work that is many years old. So this involves a lot of contributors ranging from current students to past students and collaborators. So I'd like to acknowledge all of their contributions here um, up front. So before getting into today's talk, I'll give you an overview of work in my group, the Signal Data and Imaging Sciences Laboratory at the University of Rochester. So there are currently four research trusts in my group that includes computational imaging, which is the topic of today's talk. But we also work on uh, biomedical image analysis, which is an area in which I had the privilege of collaborating with uh, Tolga. Uh, we also do some work in computer vision, and we also work on uh, brain computer and brain machine interfaces with links to areas like augmented and virtual reality uh, recently. So, uh, there are a bunch of different applications, but the common aspect is in all of this, we have some data that's complicated and we are interested in extracting information from that data uh, using probabilistic methods and, uh, and machine learning. So, uh, and that's something you'll see in today's talk, which is on computational imaging. So computational imaging has a variety of applications. There are mature imaging modalities uh, in this area, such as seismic imaging or computer tomography. There are recent uh, areas of application, such as computational microscopy or coded aperture imaging. And there are also emerging very interesting modalities like light field imaging, as well as non-line of sight imaging. In all of these, you measure some data from uh, a certain type of sensor. Uh, and the goal is to uh, find some underlying image using computation, using algorithms. So that's the common aspect of all of these different uh, applications. So in, uh, you can view all of these computational imaging problems mathematically as inverse problems. So inverse problems deal with problems where you are interested in some underlying phenomenon that you don't get to measure directly. You measure it through an observation process and you observe some data. So this forward path uh, involves a model of the observation process, all the physics, all the geometry, as well as statistical models. And the inverse problem is to go from the observed data to the underlying phenomenon. So in the context of imaging, just as an example in computer tomography, uh, the underlying uh, 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 phenomenon of interest could be an image. The observation process involves essentially a device through which you measure some data. The data in this case would be sinogram data. And the goal is to invert and go back to the image. So you model this process. Uh, using mathematical models. So the underlying image could be a vector, the data could be another vector, and there's a mapping uh, that describes all the physics involved in the process. Um, this could be a linear or nonlinear operation. So the problem is to estimate f uh, from y 
These problems are usually ill-posed inverse problems. That is, given the data, oftentimes the solution may not exist, may not be unique, may not be stable. Uh, so one has to come up with uh, solutions that incorporate oftentimes uh, additional information into the problem solution. So classical solutions involve analytical inversion, and those are usually domain-specific solutions, such as filtered back projection algorithm for tomography, or certain transformations in various types of imaging modalities or so the inversion, et cetera. So, but in all of these or in any problem of this form that's ill-posed, you have to implicitly or explicitly assume something about the underlying image. And the principal way of trying to do this involves Bayesian estimation and regularization, uh, where you model the problem probabilistically. So using uh, probability density functions over random vectors, we are essentially interested in inferring the underlying variable f from data y, and that, that involves the posterior density of f given y. And that's using Bayes' theorem that's related to a conditional uh, observation density as well as a prior uh, density. So within the context of Bayesian estimation, uh, then if you choose a certain Bayes risk, you reach uh, specific estimators such as a minimum mean squared error estimator or maximum a posterior estimator. In, in, in the case of map estimation, the, the problem of imaging becomes an optimization problem. And the two here are related essentially in the probabilistic formulation, this conditional observation model uh, in the optimization formulation of map estimation corresponds to a data fidelity term. That's essentially the term that brings in information from the data into the image formation process. And then there's a prior. So that's basically all the prior information you know or learn about uh, your underlying images. So that's the prior in the context of this probabilistic uh, model, or it could be viewed as a regularizer in the context of solving an optimization problem. So this prior or regularizer will be an important theme in, in today's uh, talk. So that's an overview of inverse problems in imaging. So with that, my plan for today will be in the first half, uh, I'll talk about uh, sparsity and compressed sensing as a method for solving computational imaging problems. Uh, this idea of sparsity and compressed sensing has been one of the prominent methods for solving computational imaging problems, I'll say over the last two decades uh, or so. Uh, we have been doing work in a variety of applications here. I'll illustrate these ideas on, on a radar imaging scenario. I'll talk about optimization algorithms we use. And then I'll just illustrate several scenarios in radar that have benefited from this perspective. So this is kind of the perspective of the, maybe the last two decades, I'll say, but we are now in the machine learning era. So now what is of interest, uh, maybe now in, in the next decade is well, machine learning methods for computational imaging. So in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about how we have been using deep learning based uh, priors for imaging problems. Uh, I'll show examples, examples in radar and ultrasound imaging. And finally, I'll talk about recent work uh, on joint imaging and uncertainty and characterization. So with that, let me start with a brief introduction to radar, since that's the modality I'll use as an example to illustrate computational imaging. So radar is an all-weather imaging modality. It can work in day and night. So the idea is you have a radar uh, sensor uh, on an airborne or a spaceborne platform. You are interested in imaging a ground patch. You send and receive electromagnetic pulses as the aircraft or the satellite traverses a flight path. So as it traverses this path, it sends and receives signals from many different observation angles. So effectively, it synthesizes uh, a virtual long antenna along its path. That's why this is called synthetic aperture uh, radar. So the computational imaging problem is given all this data collected, you want to invert uh, and obtain a spatial map of reflectivity uh, over a spatial uh, region of interest. So I will talk about the observation process just a bit in radar, because one of the things that will come up uh, in a few places in the talk is physical models in computational imaging. So I'll use this uh, radar imaging as an example to illustrate what that physical model uh, involved. So in radar, so this is a simplified view of radar imaging. Let's say you are interested in imaging this two-dimensional spatial patch. Uh, you send and receive electromagnetic pulses to the scene. So let's say the underlying uh, patch is a, a function, a two-dimensional spatial map, f of x, y. 
you send and receive uh, electromagnetic signals. Uh, in this case, an example of that is a chirp signal. Uh, and you do this uh, over multiple observation angles. Uh, after some pre-processing of the returns, you obtain a, a temporal signal. You can show that this temporal signal is related to projections of the underlying image that you are interested in imaging. And that's very similar to what happens in computer tomography and medical imaging as well. So the physics are different. However, the, the, the mathematical models are quite similar. So the observation you have here is a projectional view of the underlying uh, scene. And then you keep doing that at multiple angles. So this was in one angle. And uh, you can also view that these projections, uh, in fact, you're uh, measuring the Fourier transform of the projections. You can show that at each angle, essentially what you are measuring is a slice from the two-dimensional spatial Fourier transform of the underlying image you are trying to uh, obtain. So this, is, this involves a linear relationship between the underlying image and the data. Hence, you can discretize and write this linear relationship between the underlying image and the observed data, where this matrix A describes your, uh, your observation model uh, of, um, uh, of the data, and that involves all the physics and geometry in it. And furthermore, there's some imperfection, so there is there's noise involved. So that's the physical observation model that you would use for radar under, under certain assumptions. So the imaging, the conventional imaging here involves the following. So observing that the data lie in this two-dimensional spatial Fourier transform. So, okay, so you obtain data at one angle and then you move to a different angle, obtain another slice. When you look at the scene from a variety of observation angles, the data essentially lies in this annular type region in the spatial Fourier transform domain. Given that, conventional imaging involves interpolating this data to a rectangular grid and then taking a two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform. So it's as simple as that. So this is a typical radar image that you obtain using this kind of processing here. Uh, what you see in the scene is there's this vehicle. There are the metallic parts of the vehicle. So the radar is flying somewhere over here. This at the back is essentially electromagnetic shadow of the, of the vehicle. So that's typical radar imaging. So when we started working on radar, and this is maybe around 20 years ago or so, uh, the, our initial motivation was the use of these types of radar images in automated decision-making tasks, uh, where you would use features from the images, such as locations of dominant scatters or object boundaries and things like that. So we were interested in coming up with imaging methods that preserve or enhance these features better than existing uh, methods. And one of the key observations here was that these types of representations, if you um, uh, kind of look at their uh, structure, they have this uh, simple sparse structure. So in this case, uh, the scene is described by a small number of metallic scatterers, or in this case, the scene is uh, uh, described by the small, uh, I guess, uh, set of edges uh, that describe the objects. So the, and one idea that have, has been emerging at that time was using this kind of sparsity as a regularizer or, or, or as a prior uh, to solve ill-posed inverse problems. And that's what we worked on for radar. So this problem of uh, imposing sparsity, uh, if you formulate it directly, that is uh, given the data, you want to find a scene that's as sparse as possible, that's a combinatorial optimization problem. However, work in that domain has shown that you can use relaxed optimization formulations, especially you can use these uh, L1 or LT norm type regularizers that can enable you to get to these types of sparse representations while also uh, working on manageable um, uh, optimization uh, problems. So that's what we did for Radar, here's a basic version of an optimization problem we solved for radar imaging. So again, uh, the, the optimization formulation involves a data fidelity term and the regularizer. Again, with a Bayesian perspective, this term here can be viewed as representing your um, conditional uh, probability density function of the data given the unknown. And this term can be viewed as essentially a prior 
in this case, this kind of an L1 or LP norm prior can be viewed as a heavy tailed distribution assumption uh, on your underlying uh, reflectivities. Uh, so um, in radar, everything is complex valued, but that's something I won't focus that much on here, except that it will appear on the, on the mathematical notation. Uh, so the idea here is that you can use this term to impose different types of priors. Uh, this LP norms impose sparsity, and this matrix L essentially determines uh, what type of features are you uh, preferring as, as sparse, such as if you choose L to be an identity operator, you would be saying that the scene is expected to be sparse. Let's say it has a small number of scatters. If you choose L to be a gradient operator, that would mean that the scene has a small set of edges, or it would essentially be saying that the scene is uh, piecewise constant, or that's a preferred structure for my scene. So by playing with L, you can impose and create different types of priors on your images. Uh, so you can put in any transform that you want here, or you can even turn this into a dictionary representation in which you can form a dictionary and you can uh, essentially formulate your scene in terms of a sparse set of atoms uh, that are coming from this, uh, this dictionary. So this is a basic version. We have developed a variety of uh, versions of these optimization problems and uh, then developed algorithms to solve uh, problems of uh, this form. So here I'll focus on one type of uh, algorithm. So given these types of observation models, let me start with this generic optimization formulation, some data fidelity term and some regularizer, although specifically here, we'll use the simple data fidelity term. I'll leave the regularizer general, uh, but I'll point out what happens in the case of L1 or LP norms. Uh, again, we worked on a variety of optimization problems, but one uh, uh, algorithms, but one algorithm that I'll mention today here uh, is this idea of alternating direction method of multipliers. Uh, and the reason is it will be relevant in the later parts of the, of the talk as well. So, um, just a, one more step in the formulation. So as I mentioned, radar is complex valued, but that's not something I'll focus on that much today. So we have to represent the magnitude and phase, etc. But for our purposes, the important thing is that the optimization problem involves data, it involves some model, and I'm interested in recovering an underlying reflectivity uh, field. So this is the type of optimization problem I'd like to solve. So back to ADMM. So the, one of the key ideas in ADMM is this idea of variable splitting. Uh, so uh, if I go back here, I'm sorry. So in this formulation, the variable f, that's essentially what I care about, that's what I want to recover, appears well twice in the optimization problem, one in the data fidelity term, one in the prior. So what ADMM does or similar algorithms do is so you introduce another variable, that is one replica of f is called h, but then it introduces this constraint that, well, these are actually the same thing. So, uh, and then what you can do is, well, this, is a, this becomes now a constraint optimization problem. Then you can you form, an, uh, form a Lagrangian and turn this constraint problem into an unconstrained problem through a Lagrange multiplier. And then you have to solve uh, this problem. So the interesting thing here is now one way to solve this problem, at least to reach a global minimum of the, uh, to reach a local minimum of the problem, would be to do coordinate descent. That is, you do descent on each of these variables um, and then uh, come up with an iterative algorithm that way. So the idea would be uh, write these uh, coordinate descent steps, or in this case, each of the four variables and then do go through each of these steps in each step of the, of the iterative algorithm. So the interesting thing here is that when you do this decomposition, oftentimes each of these optimization problems has a simple form that may be easy to optimize. It may even have closed form solutions, such as in this case, uh, the update for this f or magnitude of f becomes simple, simply a quadratic optimization problem that becomes pretty easy to solve. This, uh, and, and this piece would be the piece that takes care of the regularizer. 
In our case, when the regularizer is, let's say, an L1 norm, this step essentially involves a simple, what's called a soft thresholding operation. Again, this becomes a very simple step to solve. And so this variable splitting idea decomposes the problem into a series of simpler optimization formulations at each step of the algorithm. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that this decomposition uh, splits different parts of the problem that use the data. In our case, data is in this vector y and the piece about the prior. So this decomposition says some of some steps of the algorithm involves just processing the data and doing the inversion. And the other steps of the algorithm are just imposing the prior. And this decomposition, as you will see later, is something that we can uh, take uh, advantage of. But for now, focusing on L1 or LP norm sparsity regularizers, uh, we can then solve this type of algorithm using, again, simple soft thresholding type operations in the case of uh, L1 norm priors to obtain solutions for computational imaging. So with that, let me show you a few examples of what that produces in the case of radar imaging. So in the top, you see conventional radar images. In the bottom, you see sparsely driven radar images. Again, depending on this operator you choose in your regularizer, you can uh, impose sparsity on different types of things such as by imposing sparsity on the scene directly, you can achieve things like improved resolvability of point scatters. By imposing sparsity on the gradients, you can essentially get rid of artifacts in the scene and uh, still recovering the object, object boundaries well, or you can do other types of transforms that can uh, essentially help you get improved uh, images. So that's the core idea uh, uh, as a, of sparsity-based priors in the context of uh, radar. Uh, you can also apply this on large scenes. Here's an example, an example applied on a very large scene. Again, here you see a variety of artifacts reduced by this kind of an approach, uh, especially there are these side lobe artifacts that uh, deteriorate this image, which uh, are reduced in the uh, sparsity-based uh, solution. So this is the basic uh, SAR uh, imaging scenario where you uh, observe a scene from a small range of angles, you know the observation model, et cetera. But then you can work on a variety of extensions and uh, apply these sparsity ideas. I'll give you a few ex examples without going into formulations. One idea, one problem is wide angle SAR imaging. So this was uh, motivated maybe like 15 years ago or so by emergence of UAVs, uh, where you can have this platform move around the scene and collect data on a wide range of angles, and then you want to do imaging on that. So you can observe that in that case, some of the basic assumptions of radar imaging um, uh, for narrow angle radar do not uh, hold, such as these scatters can reflect differently in different, uh, when you look at them from different angles, et cetera. So uh, you can address these types of problems using um, sparsity, and this is showing one ex example of that. So in wide angle imaging, you can again uh, show that these types of sparsity ideas can lead to improved resolution, uh, et cetera. Another interesting aspect of wide angle imaging, as I pointed out, is that these scatterers reflect differently uh, 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 when, when they are interrogated from different angles. So this is a challenge, but if you can deal it well, it turns into an opportunity in the sense that if you effectively uh, address uh, this aspect, then you can generate images in which you not only form a, a scalar valued reflectivity at each point, but you can also characterize in which direction uh, the, the, the reflectors have reflected most strongly. In this case, I'm showing an image in which color here codes the direction in which the, the scatters here reflected most, uh, most strongly. So this is wide angle uh, imaging. Uh, another, ex okay, so with wide angle imaging, it's not just direction. Uh, you can even do things like for each scatter in the scene, you can characterize as a function of angle how what their scattering response is. So basically this gives you a lot more information on the physical nature of scatters in the scene. So of course, 
essentially here from the same data, you are trying to extract more and more information. And the problem is becoming even more ill-posed. And to be able to solve this, you have to bring in constraints. And in this case, we use sparse representation methods, uh, impose certain structures on these scattering functions to extract this kind of uh, information. Another direction of extension has been uh, uh, errors in the observation model. So up to this point, we assume that you know the observation model perfectly. However, in practice, in radar or in other imaging modalities, there are imperfections in that uh, in, in, in such models, such as in radar, you may not know the position of your aircraft perfectly at each observation point. And, and if you are using the wrong model or model with errors, that can lead to artifacts in your uh, images. So uh, you can address such model error problems within the, uh, again, within the framework of uh, sparsity-based imaging. So in this case, your model A is parameterized by some unknown parameters. And, and you can jointly solve the problem of imaging and uh, model error correction. And you can show that these types of sparsity-based priors uh, help you in the process of solving such model error problems uh, as well. Let me show a few examples. So these are what I have shown you before. These are the wide angle imaging examples. This is without model errors. When you have model errors, that's when you don't know the observation model perfectly, conventional imaging fails. And our previous approach, again, that doesn't uh, treat the model errors explicitly, fails. Whereas when you explicitly take such model errors into account, uh, estimate and correct them, uh, you can uh, still obtain uh, high quality images. So model errors uh, has been another interesting work uh, on the application of sparsity based uh, methods. So you can extend this just a bit further so um, another uh, assumption in radar is that as you collect the data, the scene is stationary. However, uh, there could be moving objects in the scene. And if you don't take that into account, then that leads to a variety of artifacts, including things like uh, blurring, as you might uh, expect. So using similar ideas to what we have done with model uh, errors, uh, you can use a sparse-based framework to uh, form an image as well as correct for uh, errors induced by moving uh, targets. And the key idea here is, again, uh, this becomes a very ill-posed problem. Uh, you have to bring in much more uh, constraints. And in this case, the soft constraint we bring is that in addition to seeing the scene being sparse spatially, uh, we also assume that there are a small number of moving objects or the, the motion field essentially is also sparse. And by leveraging that, uh, you can uh, stabilize the images to obtain um, images where the, the motion blur is, uh, is elevated. And then you can look at this also with a different perspective. Uh, 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 when you look at a scene from a very wide range of uh, angles, um, and, and again, there could be moving targets. These moving targets, as in the previous example, uh, can lead to blurring, et cetera. Another perspective on this has been using sparsity together with low rankness. This is called low rank sparsity composition. And the idea is when you look at a scene from a wide range of angles, um, uh, this uh, basically what you want to do is you want to exploit all of that data for effective imaging. However, if you do that, without consideration of the moving object, objects, you observe these types of artifacts. The idea here is to note that if I split that huge aperture of data into small apertures and look at those set of images, uh, the background would be the same. Uh, however, the moving targets would be different. And that leads to this idea of uh, modeling the background as a low rank structure that doesn't change, whereas the moving objects are the changing part of the scene. When you leverage that, you can form images of this form where you can uh, reconstruct a high quality background together with stabilized uh, moving objects. And this also involves a decomposition in the process of imaging. That is, your imaging process decomposes the image into a background and into a set of moving target images. So you can essentially do trajectory estimation of moving targets together with background imaging, and you can form composite images of this form where you visualize the background as well as trajectory of the moving 
objects. So these are different ways in which uh, sparsity-based uh, priors, the simple idea of sparsity has been used effectively in the context of uh, radar uh, imaging. So with that, uh, I'll turn into the second part of the talk. Again, uh, sparsity has been uh, an asset uh, for a variety of computational imaging uh, problems over the last, I will say, two decades or so. But now we are in the era of uh, machine learning and particularly deep learning. So the next question is, well, how can, what can deep learning offer for computational imaging? And in doing this, we still will preserve this uh, probabilistic perspective uh, on image formation. Uh, one question is, so at, at, up to this point, we have noted that, um, so these are ill-posed inverse problems, bringing in effective prior information or regularizers is important, as sparsity has been one way to do it. Essential sparsity imposes some kind of prior uh, on your underlying images. So one immediate question is, can deep learning offer uh, better priors and that could that lead to then better estimators for, for images. Another question that comes with that is that has been a question in these types of uh, imaging problems for a while, whether deep learning can provide opportunities to not only image, but also do uncertainty characterization uh, in these uh, images. There are a bunch of other questions one might ask, but I'll not get into that here, partially because the rest of the talk We'll focus on these two, <clears throat> these two questions. In terms of existing deep learning based uh, imaging methods, there are a few different uh, ideas out there. Uh, the first idea is to do fully learn, do uh, essentially do full learning, that is from the data space to image space without using any physics based models, just essentially learn the mapping from the data to the image space and then use that learned model for, for, for imaging. So that's one idea. Another idea is to do learned post-processing. So the idea here is you form an image using maybe a conventional imaging technique and then treat that as an imperfect image of the underlying true image and learn a post-processing method, a deep learning method to do post-processing to, uh, to recover the underlying images. And the last two ideas uh, involve combination of learning-based methods and physics-based models. So the third idea here is to learn the prior or regularizer, just like we have done sparsity before. So think of this as rather than imposing sparsity, I just want, I, I learn what prior I should be using. And then I integrate that uh, into a model-based inversion process, just like we did for sparsity, rather than uh, imposing a sparse prior, you learn something with, with deep learning and integrate that with, with a model-based inversion process. A related idea uh, is rather than just learning the prior and then integrating it later, uh, uh, do learning of iterative schemes. So that involves end-to-end -end learning, meaning you learn a mapping from the data to the, comp to the image, However, in that process, in that learning process, you also integrate the physical model. So that's illustrated here. So the idea here would be, well, you have a training stage where you have access to either ground truth images or some reference images, which are obtained under favorable conditions. So you treat them as the, as the ground truth. And then you have a, a, a practical observation scenario, partial data, noise, et cetera. You train a network, and this network can involve within itself, can, can involve the physical model. And then you train this network, uh, learn some parameters of the network, then fix that. So you have the trained network, just like in any classification problem where neural networks have been used. Then in the test stage, you put that your test data in, again, your neural network now trained, uh, and this again incorporates the physical model uh, into the process, generates a reconstructed image. So this is this end-to-end -end learning perspective, and if the neural networks involves the physical model uh, uh, into the process, then it's, uh, it involves both uh, model integration as well as um, uh, learning it prior. So this is the uh, idea of learned iterative schemes, which is something I'll get to just a bit later in the talk. But first, I'll give you an example of this third one, which is learning the prior or regularizer. So think of this as 
replacing my sparse-based prior that I have discussed so far with a learning-based uh, prior. So, uh, and I'll again illustrate this in the context of uh, radar imaging. So the idea here is to combine physics-based forward models with learning-based priors. Uh, and the flow will be similar to what I described in the case of uh, sparse-based inversion. There will be an optimization-based uh, reconstruction. I'll again use an ADMM algorithm, but now the prior will come from, uh, from a deep learning uh, approach. So uh, back to this. So you will hopefully remember this from the early part of the talk. So we talked about the ADMM algorithm for solving computational imaging problem which essentially through variable splitting splits the problem into iterative updates with respect to data and with respect to priors. And previously we mentioned for the priors, if you use, let's say an L1 norm here, the step would be a simple soft thresholding operation. So the idea here is the following. So if you note, again, the point here was, these are data update steps. These explicitly use the measured data. In this step, everything is in the image domain. So essentially this H tilde, although the definition is not on the slide, is essentially your uh, imperfect image recovered at this point of your iteration. So the goal of this step is to take this imperfect image and map it to a better image. Uh, when we apply a sparse based prior to a soft thresholding, it's trying to do something like this. So the idea here is that perhaps you can replace this entire step, this update step, with a neural network. Uh, and deep learning has been very successful in tasks like image denoising. So perhaps I can learn a denoiser using deep learning um, and then insert that network as this step of the algorithm. So that brings in an implicit regularizer uh, where the regularization is defined by how the neural network is denoising your images. But then the overall al algorithm still works as a, as a computational imaging algorithm because there are the data inversion steps uh, together with the prior or denoising step. So that's the idea of uh, using a learned prior within the context of uh, an iterative computational imaging algorithm that also incorporates the physical model into, into the process. So this is, the, uh, this is one idea. So here, again, this uh, prior step involves a basic neural network. I won't get into the structure. This is a basic denoising CNN. It maps, it's from Im Im image space to image space. So it involves uh, essentially image denoising. Uh, but again, combined with these other steps, it is now it operates as part of a, uh, a computational imaging uh, algorithm. So this is one idea. Let me show you uh, how we apply this idea to radar imaging. I'll first do some synthetic experiments uh, to, to illustrate the idea. Uh, so here are some synthetic scenes that we have used to train this network. We have sort of uh, noisy or imperfect versions of these scenes that have been used in the training process. Uh, and then we have a different test set, uh, similar types of images, but different images. So with that, here are some uh, results. So in the test stage, we look at uh, different levels of noise, different levels of data availability, et cetera. So since this is a synthetic scene, we have access to ground truth. We can control how much data are available uh, in the test stage, et cetera. So what I'll show you here is this bottom right image is the, is the ground truth. So that's what we are trying to obtain. The top left image, is the conventional image. In a scenario, we have some level of noise, and in this case, pretty, much, uh, pretty high data availability. And then these three are three different let, uh, uh, approaches, uh, uh, existing methods, I'll say. And then this one in the bottom middle is the proposed deep learning uh, based uh, computational imaging approach. So in this case, all methods perform reasonably well we'll see what happens when you reduce the data. So in this case, it was 90%. You reduce it to 70% data. So you start seeing degradation in performance in all methods. But the question is how gradual the degradation is, of course, in, in different methods. So such as in conventional, in the conventional image, you pretty much have, have lost all the features over here. 
these other methods, while behave uh, differently in different parts, our proposed learning-based method uh, behaves pretty well in protecting these features, although it also starts degrading in some parts. Then you reduce the data further. This is what happens with 50% of the data. So you can have a look, interpret it for yourself. And then if you push harder, well, all the methods now suffer quite a bit. Uh, but again, the, the, the degradation patterns are quite different. So this gives you a sense of how this uh, learning-based method, again, let me put up maybe this one as a representative one, behaves in the synthetic experiment. So this is synthetic data. Then uh, we apply, we have applied this on real data. So this is uh, real radar uh, images obtained from uh, uh, satellite Terrasar X. So we do training based on a large scene obtained from one part of the world. In this case, is seen in Korea. Uh, we split the scene into small patches, and then we use these as different training samples to train our network. And then for test, we use, again, a big image from another part of the world. Uh, and in this case, it's a region between Turkey, Greece, and Bulgaria. Uh, so it's just, it's an unseen uh, uh, scene for the, for, for, for the network. And then we, again, split that into small images. We use these as test <coughs> images for, your, for our algorithm. Uh, I'll show you results that in a similar way to the synthetic scene example, so the top, uh, the bottom right here, uh, this is now the reference scene. Uh, you can do this as the clean image obtained from a large amount of data with a um, uh, small amount of noise. Uh, and then we synthetically reduce data and add noise uh, in, our, in our test scenario. Again, top left is the conventional image. Bottom middle is, is our proposed uh, method. This is, again, high data avail availability. Then we reduce the data. This is what happens with 70%, uh, 50%, 30%. Again, this is, these are image, images are a bit small, but again, if you focus on different parts of the image, you can uh, observe that this method is uh, much more effective compared to the other methods shown here in terms of preserving certain types of features, such as these scatters over here or over there. Uh, so overall, uh, it, it is more robust to limitations in, in the quantity of the data available to the, to the method. So this is uh, our first attempt to apply uh, deep learning-based methods uh, as priors for, for radar imaging. We are also playing with other modalities. I'll show you uh, other imaging modalities. I'll show you one example, although this is very preliminary at this point. This is ultrasound elasticity imaging. Uh, so elasticity imaging is a modality uh, that can distinguish normal and diseased tissues uh, by quantifying their stiffness. So the idea is uh, you apply some uh, force to, uh, to, um, to the object and then collect ultrasound images. Uh, and the goal is to characterize the stiffness of, uh, of the entire image uh, uh, and, and characterize it uh, quantitatively. Just to illustrate this, what is shown at the bottom here is on the left here is a, a classical B-mode ultrasound image. Mm, uh, they're well brighter and dark spots. What's shown on the right in this colored image is an elasticity image. And what you see here is so blue indicates hard objects. So are, those are stiffer uh, tissues, whereas red is softer tissues. So this provides important clinical information, that is uh, information that this part is much stiffer than the other dark parts in the image, let's say, is not available in the ultrasound image, but that's something you can obtain from the elasticity image. And that's important in characterizing abnormal uh, tissues, et cetera, in, uh, in a variety of uh, anatomical uh, structures. So the way that the imaging uh, and elasticity imaging is done is, well, you apply force by an ultrasound probe, uh, and then the tissue behaves differently depending on how soft or how hard it is. And then as you do this, uh, you uh, acquire multiple ultrasound uh, images. By processing these images and doing some cross-correlation, you estimate 
the displacement uh, imposed on different parts of the image. And that's this uh, variable or uh, function u of x, y that you essentially measure. So given you viewing this as a measurement and the other information you have is the force that's applied here on the boundary of the object that's used as a boundary condition. The goal is to recover the underlying elasticity uh, map of the scene from this. So there's a lot of physics involved. Uh, there are detailed physical models that relate elasticity, or in this case, Young's modules of elasticity, displacement, and the boundary force that is applied, that is applied on the scene using these types of physical models, measurements of displacement, people have come up with a variety of inverse problem solutions. Again, things like regularization have been used uh, uh, extensively in this domain. So what we are experimenting with is the question of, well, can we, like, just like we did for radar, would it be interesting to apply these deep learning-based priors in this uh, setting? So the idea, again, here is to uh, train a denoising CNN. In this case, we have looked at an experiment in which we have these synthetic breast lesion data, where we have these synthetic uh, elasticity images. Uh, we uh, learn a denoiser from this data. And then just like we did for radar, uh, you, we have an ADMM-like algorithm that combines the physical model inversion and regularization as learned from the uh, by the deep learning based net network uh, to come up with a numerical uh, algorithm. Uh, at this point, what we have is just proof of concept. So I'll just show you one image. There is not much to say here. It's just that uh, on a basic scenario, uh, this seems to work. It's possible to do this, although we are yet to study and understand uh, under what scenarios this would lead to advantages over, over existing uh, methods. So let's see how I'm doing in time. So, okay, so that is that brings me to the last part of my uh, talk. Well, I hope I have another like 10 minutes or so to go through that part. Is, is that okay? Um, Steve, what is the typical ending time? I think that's okay. But so if, if I don't have- uh, Yeah, the just... typical ending time is about 3.55. Okay. okay. So you could set something up and then if somebody wants to ask a question about it, Okay. Going back to it. Okay. So you recommend that I finish in 55? About there. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of where. Yeah. Okay. Then I will, I mean, I, then I will skip the formulation here and then just focus on the idea. So the, the goal here is to do both imaging and uncertainty characterization. So up to this point, like in this radar imaging example, I have shown how you can use a deep learning prior and use that together with a physical model to form, to reconstruct an image. So in all of this, the idea was to train the network and set these network parameters. In this case, theta represents all the neural network parameters and then uh, fix that network to get a reconstructed image. So now we are interested in understanding, well, how confident should we be in this reconstruction, uh, can we get a spatial map of uncertainty uh, in that process? So with that, then I will skip all the formulations, get to maybe the uh, what we get at the end, perhaps. So what we do here is, so based on, I'll say, probabilistic formulation and using ideas from what's called Bayesian neural networks, we come up with a formulation where you essentially have two networks. One network uh, is just like we described before in the context of radar, does uh, recovery of images. Uh, however, in this process, uh, we apply dropout. So for those of you who are already studying the networks, you might know that dropout is, is a regularization method used in deep uh, learning where the idea is to uh, block some of the nodes in the training process. And people have shown that doing this gives you gives better generalization capabilities to the, to the neural network. So that's one aspect. But together with that, we train another neural network that is aimed to uh, infer essentially an uncertainty map uh, on your images. And to be able to do this, we use variational Bayes uh, methods. Uh, 
uh, in this training uh, process. So that's one aspect. The other thing that we do is, so let me point that out here. So in the test process, so that's what happens in training. In the test process, uh, we also use dropout and that's called now Monte Carlo uh, dropout where rather than passing your data from these networks once, you pass it t times. And at each pass, the dropout is active. So essentially at each pass, they go through a different network. And that process uh, under certain assumptions, you can show that it is essentially generating samples uh, from uh, uh, your posterior density of the images under a certain model. And furthermore, you can show that in this process, you can characterize two types of uncertainty. And I'll just point that out, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, at the end if needed. So you can, what you can do is, so you pass the data from your network T times. So essentially you are getting, rather than one reconstruction, you get T reconstructions. You can think of these as samples from the posterior density uh, of your uh, image. And you can, if you average them out, you can get something like the predictive mean reconstruction. But these two neural networks also give you two uncertainty estimates. One uncertainty estimate is the inherent uncertainty in the data. So that's like uncertainty in your prior, uncertainty in the noise, uncertainty imposed by the nature of the forward model, et cetera. But there's also it's oftentimes called aleatoric uncertainty in this context of Bayesian neural networks. And the other uncertainty you get is uncertainty in the parameters of the neural network that does the computational imaging. And that is oftentimes called epistemic uncertainty. And that's essentially measuring how well, well, how well your training data and test data uh, match. Or in, others, uh, in other words, how well your learned network is generalizing to the very test data uh, you have used uh, in this particular uh, setting. So you can obtain these two uncertainty maps separately. You can visualize them separately as I'll show you here in an MR imaging example. So here, this is some reference image for a test sample. Uh, uh, under certain level of data availability. This is the mean image we obtain, but what's important here is the uncertainty map. So as I mentioned, we get these two uncertainty maps. One is the inherent uncertainty in the data. And this is the types of things, again, uncertainty in the prior, in the noise, in, as imposed by the forward model. And what you will observe here is that uncertainty is higher in parts of the image where you expect more variability, and uh, I guess those are the more challenging parts of the image to, uh, uh, to recover. The parameter uncertainty, again, is measuring how well your training and test data match. And in some sense, uh, this is the part of uncertainty that can be explained away if you have infinite and representative training data. So this is this, so you can say we have done experiments in which you play with the amount of test data, a, a, a amount of training data. As you have smaller amounts of training data, this uncertainty goes up. And here's an interesting experiment you can do. So let's look at an example in which your test image has a strange square object in the foreground. The training data doesn't have anything like this. So you can certainly create a reconstruction. Your reconstruction would look like this. But what is interesting is that in this case, your parameter uncertainty map essentially marks this as an interesting region. This has very high uncertainty here. That points out that essentially it is saying that your test data is not coming from the same distribution of your training data. So essentially it indicates that there's something that's uh, essentially an out of sample type uh, behavior here. You can look at other scenarios. One other scenario is where the measurement setup at the test stage differs from the training stage. And then I won't get into details, but this is a scenario that actually contributes to both types of uncertainty. Again, that, that's something you see in the, in the uncertainty maps. So let me conclude uh, by saying that, well, I have talked about Bayesian and machine learning based methods for computational imaging today. Applications range from biomedicine to remote sensing, as well as others. So I first talked about sparsity 
It's a useful asset, I will say, from the last decade for computational imaging. It had its role, had some impact uh, in, in the domain. Uh, but now uh, we are exploring, and others are exploring, deep learning-based methods um, uh, that, uh, up to this point, preliminary work shows that these methods may have the potential to learn complicated spatial patterns uh, to be used as priors in computational imaging. But perhaps what's also interesting, and I hope that that was clear in the talk, is that what connects all of this is this Bayesian and probabilistic thinking, and that will be common. And I think that will be important in understanding and analyzing uh, these deep learning based methods as well. And another aspect uh, I hope uh, that was clear from my talk is that I'm interested in principle of integration of physics based models and machine learning rather than throwing out physics-based models uh, completely uh, out of the window. So we, we are interested in using machine learning to complement what we cannot reliably model uh, based on the underlying physics. There are a bunch of directions of underlying work all the way from applying these methods to different settings, using a variety of networks all the way from uh, GANs to variational autoencoders, et cetera. Uh, this is uh, both for purposes of improving imaging performance, but also in terms of theoretical behavior uh, and interpretation of these networks. There's a lot of work on analyzing networks, analyzing the behavior of the resulting algorithms, confidence, uncertainty characterization, as I described at the end of my talk today, or more generally sampling uh, the posterior density uh, of images is an interesting direction. As in all deep learning, explainability and statistical interpretation characterization is on the agenda in the context of computational limiting as well. Finally, there's this question of, well, uh, we do computational imaging, but in, in many imaging problems, there's oftentimes a decision making, some image analysis task uh, that's done based on that computational image. So what does this mean using uh, deep learning? Uh, should these, uh, can these two problems be related? In some settings, should we be solving them jointly? Or in some cases, should we be skipping the imaging step and going through uh, decision-making using uh, deep learning tools are, I think, questions that will be on the agenda. So that ends the technical part of my talk. Let me also say that another hat I'm wearing is uh, I'm directing our data science institute where there is research in a variety of uh, domains. So if any of you are interested in exploring collaboration possibilities or anything else, please get in touch with me. And that's the website of the Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Ishdat, for a very interesting talk. Um, if there are questions from the audience, uh, you can either type it into the Q&A box or you're welcome to, to raise your hand and uh, uh, ask the question in person. Um, so I'll get started maybe with a question. So sure. you mentioned that you're integrated, you're interested in the integration of physics-based modeling with machine learning. Um, mm -hmm. And in the first part of your talk, you noted that sometimes the forward model, you know, is not perfect and you need to use some parameters to adjust that. Um, mm -hmm. um, and in the second part, so you're using deep learning, if I understand correctly, mostly for modeling the prior, but uh, the physics-based mm -hmm. part is the forward model. Is there a way to use machine learning in the forward model as well without throwing out the, the physics-based modeling so somehow integrated in there? Yes, actually we have some preliminary work in that direction. I haven't put that here for two reasons. It's preliminary, not published yet, but yes. So just like we were doing for sparsity-based imaging, you can, in a straightforward way, uh, first of all, extend the deep learning-based methods uh, to also apply to scenarios in which their model errors. Uh, but then you can also, of course, use them uh, for that learning process as well. So the types of problems we have looked at so far for model error correction uh, were uh, problems in which simple parameter estimation was sufficient for model error correction. However, that may not always be the case. There could be complicated structures in, uh, in that model error process that it, it's in itself can uh, be in interesting from a learning perspective. So yes, absolutely. So there are ways to use physics as well as uh, describe which parts of the models are not learned, not, not known uh, precisely, and you can open up uh, that those parts to learning. So that's an excellent question. 
Um, and to follow up with the neural network part, um, so I, you didn't go into too much detail about this. It wasn't the focus of your talk, but I noticed that when you showed the, the convolutional neural network architecture that you used for your prior, that it basically was a convolutional layers followed by batch norm layers, but didn't really involve any downsampling or upsampling, like for instance, as we see in the UNet, right, mm -hmm. for segmenting yeah. images. Um, are there alternatives that do that, or is there a reason not to do that? So uh, yeah, that's a good question too. Although I'm not an expert in architecture, so I may not be able to, I may not be giving uh, a very well-informed uh, answer. However, I should point out that, so for the, for the types of networks we used here, so these were essentially denoising uh, CNNs. So, and then this is, so since in this case, we were essentially trying to implement a denoiser that was sufficient for our purposes. Uh, but, uh, in the, that I didn't go into that uh, in depth, but in the uncertainty characterization part, in fact, one of the networks we use is a UNet. So this network that uh, infers the uh, the covariance uh, matrix of the of the data, that's a UNet architecture. So overall, again, I won't be able to give a very well informed answer to that, but there's space for uh, different types of architectures as well. So beyond that. There has also been a lot of recent work on things like generative adversarial networks in computational imaging problems, uh, all the way from cycle GANs to Wasserstein GANs, uh, and those are also on the uh, on the agenda. Especially things like Wasserstein GANs are interesting, especially by principled formulations of priors because they can be used as well, you can use them to represent priors through things like earth movers distances uh, and uh, divergences. Uh, so there's room for using different architectures uh, in, 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 this, um, in this process. So I don't see anything further. Uh, if that's the case, I would like to thank Mishdat one more time. Uh, thanks for this very interesting talk and, um, and our session here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Logan, for the invitation. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Bye.